Well, good morning. So good to be here again to worship the Lord together. And as we continue our evening worship in the morning series, um, we now move after singing a few hymns to a short sermon and then to our congregational prayer together. So let us go before the Lord right now, before the sermon, asking him for help for the rest of our service. Let's pray. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us profit from your word today. Help us see that we can come to you even when we don't feel like we can come to you. Help us all see that today and see why even that is the case. Oh Lord, help us. Give us eyes to see these things, ears to hear these things. Let us all be able to lean in to the reality of your word today so that we might be changed and transformed which is only what your word can do. Your word does that in our lives. So we ask, oh Lord, that you would help even the word to do that in all of our lives today. We say this in Christ's name. Amen. In the Old Testament, priests were given to the task of sacrificing animals as religious ritual to deal with Israel's sin according to God's law under the Old Covenant. These priests would never be out of a job because, let me tell you what, people continued to sin. Therefore, these priests always had job security. In particular, God's chosen people, Israel, were a pretty disobedient bunch if you read your Bibles and through the Old Testament. But so is all mankind, right? So are all of us. But the point is that these people would never run out of the need to have a priest to sacrifice animals for them in the temple for their many sins. That's in large part a big part of the purpose and the reason and what we see revealed even in our Old Testaments. But we see in the book of Hebrews that this whole Old Testament sacrificial system, you see, it just wasn't enough because these Old Testament sacrifices were not enough to actually truly take away or atone for sins. For we see in Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 3 through 4, it says, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, since this sacrificial system wasn't enough, there had to be another way. There had to be another priest, even. Someone who could take away sins, because apparently these animals and Israel's priests weren't cutting it, were they? This leads us to our passage this morning in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, which was Tuesday's reading from Robert Murray McShane's Bible, McShane's Bible reading plan, for those of you who are using that plan in your daily reading. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. This is God's holy and authoritative, inspired communication, inspired word for us to live by. Let's see what it has to say for us this morning. Verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
being relatable and being relevant are attributes, I'd say, are valued by many in our day. And for good reason. No one wants to listen to an eighth grade science teacher who is close to retirement and has done this job his whole life or her whole life be a broadcast announcer at the Super Bowl, do they? Why? Because he or she is not qualified and experienced to do the task of announcing the big game. You see, they're qualified to teach science, but probably wouldn't help the television ratings at all, would they? No. This same principle is often even why parents find children growing into adolescence so scary and oh so very confusing, and vice versa. For as these parents are aging, so are their children, only in different generations, and really in a completely different world than when they grew up and went to school, right? The culture shifts so quickly, and if parents skip a beat, all of a sudden they feel disconnected to try to relate to their kids and being aware of how things are going on in their day, right? Not knowing what their children may be going through because they are so struggling with the changes over time. But let me tell you up front, right here in the beginning, though many would probably think quite the opposite of what I'm going to say right now, this is not how it is with Jesus. Most unbelievers see him as antiquated, repressive, and certainly so out of touch with our world today that he is just irrelevant to them. We know that. But this sentiment isn't limited only to unbelievers. For hear this, for in a different but similar way, Christians can sometimes completely write Jesus off as irrelevant to the here and now as well. In their minds, Jesus is limited to the Sunday school classroom. He's limited to what happens at church alone. We worship at church, but he doesn't come up much in my home or in the workplace or in the practical matters of life because Jesus is for what happens on Sunday. And we'll let the preacher figure all that out. But this is so, so very far from the truth. And this leads us to our first point this morning. And number one, the great high priest. Look with me in your Bibles at verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. As I mentioned before, in the Old Testament, priests offered animals a sacrifice uh, and sacrifices, but the animal blood didn't truly cleanse sin's guilt, did it? And these Old Testament priests couldn't really deal with the main problems, and they couldn't get the job done. Not for himself, right, because the priest was a sinner, and not for others, ultimately, either, right? But the great high priest was different. Jesus was better than all of them. And the sacrifice he made was able to actually take away sins. How do I know that? Well, because after he died to shed his blood... He was risen from the dead in a miraculous way, and after he appeared to many, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father in the heavens. So, the author of Hebrews wants us now, here, as believers, right now, in our day, to have confidence in the gospel message because we have a great high priest. A high priest who was able to see, as we see emphasized even in verse 14, 
both the divine Son of God and also Jesus of Nazareth. He was both fully divine and fully God, but he was also fully and truly man as well. And, and, and this high priest is right at the right hand of God, the Father, a place even of authority. And he's not there in heaven. He's not just there to be kind of, for us to just be aware of it and kind of check it off of something we believe. Yeah, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. No, he's at the right hand of the Father for a reason. A reason tied to his identity as the high priest. So I would encourage all of you to have confidence up front right here in your confession of faith in him right now. Be confident in this high priest for who he was and what he did and where he is. But also, I want to turn now to our second point to see why Jesus is the relatable, the relevant, and perfect high priest to begin with. Look with me in your Bibles at verse 15, and we will see at number two, the sympathetic high priest from verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. It's not that we needed a priest, but that we needed the right priest, okay? There were other priests who could never get the job done for us, in fact, they were never intended to get the ultimate job of dealing with sin done for us to begin with. For these other priests were sinful men. Jesus, our great high priest, the better priest, was sinless. The other priests may have been able to relate in part because, of course, they were sinners too, like us. But they didn't know the people, really, did they? And they hadn't gone through all the things that others have gone through either, did they? No, Jesus was tempted, it says, in every respect as we are, but went through it all without fail and without sin. You see that there in your Bibles? Look, I realize that you may have gone through a whole lot in your life. A whole lot of suffering and trials uh, and temptations. And I can't, as your pastor, pretend to be able to relate to all of your situations and the weight and the severity of exactly what you have gone through in your lives. I never could. But Jesus can. He suffered physically on the cross for your sins. He suffered in a different way even, in a non-physical way as well, as he bore the weight and guilt and penalty of your sin, of our sin, on the cross. He lived a life of trials, didn't he? Anyone who's read through the Gospels will see that. that he lived a life full of joys, and happiness, sure, but also sadness and trials and despair and difficulty. He experienced betrayal, let me remind you. He experienced others letting him down regularly, let me remind you. He was tempted in various ways, in various severe ways, even. And I don't know for sure, but I guess, and I would guess, that none of you have faced the kinds of temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness when the devil himself prepared an onslaught of temptation to bring Jesus down there in the wilderness. In Luke 4, we see an account of Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness after Jesus had not eaten for 40 days in the wilderness. 
The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus refutes Satan in that temptation by saying to him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And then Satan continued to tempt him in other ways as well, relating to power of the kingdoms and authority, and then also relating to God's own power as well. And Jesus refuted him every time in the wilderness. But Jesus was tempted and tried, and he was successful in refuting the satanic Attack, and he did not sin then in the wilderness. And he did not sin prior to that. And he did not sin after that. He did not sin in anything that he ever did. Not in his thoughts. Not in his deeds. Though he was tempted, he did not sin. Though he went through many trials and many temptations and many difficulties, he did not sin. Various ways he was tempted like we are, yet Jesus remained and is sinless. He can relate to us because he is a human being like us. He experienced what we experience. This is relatable. Do you see that? He's relatable. He's relevant. He's a worthy high priest who can actually uh, be someone that we can go to because he knows and knew and, and, and is aware of what we are going through because of who he is. That's the Jesus that we know, relatable, relevant, experienced in the things of human temptation and trials and, and despair and difficulty. He's experienced in those ways. You think you're experienced in those ways, and I know that you are. He is too. What a high priest that we have. For we read a little earlier prior to our passage in Hebrews chapter 2, and verses 17 through 18, that says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. All of us should see Jesus not as some eighth grade science teacher posing as an announcer at the Super Bowl, which would just never work. And not some out-of-touch friend or family member who just doesn't get us. That's not how we should see Jesus. No, we should see him for who he truly is. As someone who can sympathize with what we actually go through ourselves in our lives. This leads us now to our last point. To consider why all of this really matters to us to begin with and where all of these realities of this great high priest, this sympathetic high priest leads us even right here this morning and in all of our lives. And number three, full access through the high priest. Look with me in your Bibles at Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The very reason we are meeting this morning to worship, the very way that we conduct our worship together has everything to do with this great high Priest, we can't approach a holy God as sinful men and women. We have no right to do that. Do you see that? Do you feel that? The child who comes up to their parents demanding this or that of their parents usually doesn't get met with a big smile of approval from their parents. Do they? 
the junior salesman or woman in the company going to the CEO with a bone to pick to tell them what they should be doing or how it should be done usually doesn't get the time of day. And depending on the size of the company, we'll never even meet the CEO to begin with. You see, we have access to God the Father in prayer through God the Son, Jesus Christ, our great high priest. The access code was undecisive and undecipherable for us. We couldn't figure out the combo to approach God. We didn't have the little beeper key to get in with the credentials. Uh, but let me encourage you. Jesus does have the credentials. And so we have confident access to the Father through the work of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. This means when we pray, we pray to the Father and our prayers are actually heard and we are not just kind of snuffed out because of our sin, because of what Jesus did for us as our great high priest. This means that when we have our worship services here at First Baptist Church of Gallatin, we can go before God in prayer and we can sing songs of praise to Him, thanking Him, and we can gather together and hear the word preached and go before God, right? Because of what Jesus did for us as our high priest. The high priest has everything to do with our prayers. The high priest has everything to do with our worship. Uh, we can't go before him. We can't go before the Lord at all to even think about approaching him. If it wasn't for the high priest on our behalf to pray to him, to worship him, to do anything as it relates to him, he is so great, we dare not approach him unless we have a mediator, unless we have a high priest, unless we have someone praying for us, interceding for us, unless we have someone at the right hand of God the Father in the heavens. And let me tell you, church, this high priest is not some aloof, out of touch mediator or priest, right? Not at all. We struggle in this life. He struggled throughout his life. We are tempted. He was tempted. We suffer. He suffered much. We are in need, and we have many, many countless needs. He provides for our needs, and he knows the needs that we have. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to thirst. He knew what it was to have enemies. He knew what it was to be persecuted, to be laughed at, to be mocked, to be without, to be in great need. We need grace, let me tell you. Most importantly, due to our sin and our weaknesses, our trials, but let me tell you again, Jesus Christ is our great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses and he knows all of our trials. And not only that, he did everything that was necessary that those priests of old could never dream of doing. He actually took away the full guilt of all of our sins. And now, church, we can approach God because of him. We all can have confidence, access to prayer and worship because of him. And later, even heaven itself because of what he's done for us. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful that you sent your son to undeserving sinners like us so that we might have someone relatable, so that we might have someone who truly knows us, so that we might have someone who truly covers our guilt and sin, which are many. We are needy, O oh God. You provided for our needs, our greatest need, and your son, the great high priest. We thank you, O oh God, and we say this in Christ's name. Amen. All right.